read mark it. The white letters on the light gray background. I do the best Perfect I can. color choice. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, John? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Apparently. <laughs> so this thing's. We'll blame the projector like all of the other previous speakers. Uh, I've got no one to blame but myself. So. Except that uh, this is amusing. Is it going on? Uh, yeah, it's on. Just Okay, I'm good. All right, so, so next we have Mark uh, Havey, who will tell us about light scattering from a dense and cold microscopic rubidium photonic cloud. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> one of the biggest channel, uh, one of the biggest challenges is, is dealing with cold atomic gases is to figure out what to call your sample. You call it a sample, it sounds like chemistry. You call it a cloud, I don't know what it sounds like, something from Apple. And if... You, <laughs> And if you call it an ensemble, you sound like a theorist. And so this, it's a no-win situation. So I'm entertaining uh, synonyms uh, for, uh, for, for what I call at this time an atomic cloud. Anyway, my name is Mark Havey, and uh, uh, my colleagues are two graduate students, Casey Hagen, Stetson Roof, and uh, two theory colleagues from St. Petersburg, Igor, one of the many Igor Sokolovs, and Dima Kuprianov. And our financial support comes from these sources. The most interesting of these is the Federal Program of Scientific and Scientific Pedagogical Personnel of Innovative Russia. Yeah, that's right. So they told me what to write, so that's all I do is do it. So, In any case, uh, let me move on to my first slide. Uh, see if this is... How come it doesn't work? It worked. Okay, so these are the introductory remarks, and uh, then in previous studies where I'm going to start with a brief sketch, I'm going to talk about coherent backscattering of light, uh, and then coherent backscattering in stronger fields. Uh, backscattering is obviously in the backwards direction, uh, that, and then I'm going to, going to walk 90 degrees around my apparatus and look at sideways scattering of light in the sideways direction and say a few things about what we see in that particular uh, avenue, and then I'm going to finish the cold atom part of the talk by moving to forward scattering direction and talk about our recent uh, work in forward scattering of light from a cold dense and dense gas. And if I have a few minutes, uh, I've got a uh, little demonstration of classical uh, uh, Anderson localization of light that you can set up for your undergraduates and doing it. It illustrates all the essential features uh, with almost no cost. So that's something that appeals to me. Okay, so broadly speaking, light scattering in atomic gases, we start with a low-density gas. Uh, a low-density gas is characterized in some sense, in some way, by the product KL being much greater than 1, where L is the uh, transport mean-free path for light scattering, and K is the wave vector of the light. And so this corresponds to a very dilute gas. Uh, and under those circumstances, the microscopic atomic response is well known. Uh, at least in weak fields, coherent backscattering can occur. You can get coherent control of multiple scattering, including coherent backscattering using EIT or Raman configurations. And one of the more intriguing results that has come out in the last year is the demonstration of random lasing in three dimensions, and that came out of Robin Kaiser's group and appeared in, in, uh, in Nature a few months ago. Uh, in a denser gas, as you make the evolution down the chain here, in the denser gas, uh, you reach the point where the mean free path for light scattering is on the order of the wavelength itself, and under those conditions it doesn't really make sense to talk about light scattering in terms of an individual scattering and then propagation. The nearest neighbors are so close that, they poke, that all the nearest neighbors poke holes in the outgoing wavefront right there immediately, and so it doesn't in the near field, and so it doesn't make any sense to talk about light scattering that way, and instead you need to think about light scattering in terms of collective or cooperative scattering from the object as a whole. And again, the microscopic response is, uh, maybe surprisingly to some of you, is not very well understood what happens on the microscopic scale. It's very complex, uh, and there's a variety of physics, and I'll talk about some of those things. In forward scattering, we get an external uh, external probe and experimental handle on the microscopic response of the sample as a whole. Uh, two of the interesting things that, that can happen in terms of quantum optics is that it's possible to make a quasi-one-dimensional scattering configuration 
And within that configuration, it's possible to see light localization. This is Anderson localization of light. Uh, and it's also possible to see gain and maybe even random lasing in one dimension. Okay, one dimensional geometry has some attractive features, including simplified theory. Okay, and so our experiments are all based on investigations by either imaging, light scattering from the sample, or by spectral and time domain techniques. That is to say, we don't directly probe the atom state as a result of excitation with the probe, so we're looking at the, at the global properties of the, light scattered by, uh, of the light scattered by the sample itself. There's a couple of reviews if you're interested. It's here, uh, they're down here, and let me point out that each page is numbered, and so if you have a question about a certain slide and you want to wait till the end, you just can write down the number or remember the number, and then we can go back to that slide. Keeps hunting and pecking to a minimum. Okay, so the first part of the talk consists of, of backward scattering and sideways scattering of light, light scattering from a microscopic sample this time, uh, coherent backscattering, and afterglow. Okay, so this is sometimes called weak local light localization, even though it's no real localization of light at all. And uh, some of you have probably seen these results. They're not new. Uh, so if you imagine, though, in the physics, that if you start with a plane wave, that is some wave front that's large compared to the atomic sample, and it's coming from the left, and it scatters off this ensemble of scatterers. So this obviously is is a schematic representation of a not quantum degenerate gas because the atoms are indicated by little dots. And so the, the waves can come in and each piece of this plane wave, if you like, can scatter off each one of these uh, atomic scatterers. And so let's focus on a particular one of the many possible paths. And so if we take this plane wave, piece of this plane wave that scatters on this atom, one possible uh, route that it can follow is scattering this way off the second atom, the third atom, and then out it goes. But the time reverse path is equally likely, and if these scatterers are static, that is if they're not moving, then there's a geometrical phase between these two paths, but otherwise the phase difference is the same. Uh, and so consequently these two paths interfere with each other, and to make these two paths close you have to put some, some con condensing lens out here and bring that light together. And when it does, that light interferes, and if these phases are the same, and if the geometrical phase is the same, and it is, then they interfere constructively. And so this is, one of, this is a, a classical optics effect, and uh, classical optics has been around for a very long time, and this effect of coherent backscattering from classical scatters was discovered maybe 25 or 30 years ago, that's all. So it's it, could, it could, in principle, have been discovered 100 years ago. But it wasn't, and so it's one of those things where, uh, where you read about it, and you, uh, to answer this question that someone said this morning about it's been around so long, someone must have measured that already. And the answer is sometimes there are subtle things that you actually do have to open the door and look, and then you find something new. So this is one of those things that were new. Uh, Robin Kaiser's group in Nice first measured coherent backscattering from cold atoms, and we thought it was a neat thing to do, so we got started on this. And this is some of our data of coherent backscattering from a cold atom uh, rubidium-85 sample. Uh, and you see the interferometric enhancement, that's the dots with a little ratty noise on it. The solid curve underneath is a, uh, is a theoretical simulation with no adjustable parameters. Uh, the calculations are made. Uh, basically, you give, them the size, you give them the density distribution within the cloud and that you're in a weak field limit and the theory takes care of all the rest. There's, so there's nothing adjustable in there. Uh, you should notice down here that it's possible to get an interferometric enhancement of up to a factor of two, but that doesn't happen in rubidium, and that's because of the uh, deleterious influence of spin and spin degeneracy. That is, even if you scatter off, the, when you scatter off these paths, there's more to it than that, because you can scatter from one Zeeman component here to another Zeeman component here, and in the reverse path, it doesn't have to happen in that same order. There are more than one Zeeman so there's more dimensionality to this system, if you like. Okay, the degeneracy of the states count as some measure of additional, uh, uh, additional uh, degrees of freedom. So is this just like weak localization of, uh, yeah, in solid state physics? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so one thing that happens, and the main thing I want to, to point out here before moving on to sideways scattering, 
is that if you crank up the intensity of the probe light, then you can suppress the formation of this coherent backscattering feature, as you can see. This is the external saturation parameter, and when the field is weak, you get a nice coherent backscattering cone, you can see it, and as you ramp up the intensity, the, uh, the uh, enhancement of that cone goes away. The enhancement is the fraction, fractional enhancement relative to the average background. You can see that it drops off. Uh, this uh, actually is very hard to calculate because you're saturating all the atoms in the sample with different saturation parameters because some of the light doesn't penetrate as far. Anyway, anyway it's messy. Uh, but the general mechanism that uh, most people accept for this is that as the applied field goes up, you get inelastic scattering, and so the small delta function part of the atomic response when you crank up the, crank up the intensity uh, gets relatively swamped by these incoherent components, and so you don't get as much interference when you're scattering from one atom to the next, uh, and so that ends up with a, a uh, basically suppression of the enhancement. Uh, so there we go. And so the question, the takeaway question from these two slides is, does coherence matter for coherent backscattering from cold atoms? And yeah, it does. It's coherent backscattering and there's interference. Okay, so if there's an interferometric effect, there's at least coherence and first order interference that's important. Okay, so now let's move on to sideways scattering. Uh, you'll see that sideways scattering is not exactly fully sideways scattering. Uh, this channel, this is uh, a sort of picture of the uh, experimental chamber. The fluorescence comes out in this direction. The excitation is in this direction. And so we're, it's not really at 90 degrees, it's more like a 36 degree angle. You have to put these ports in where you have space to put the ports in, and that's where we had space. So that's what we did. Okay, so that's the, so it's sideways scattering. Uh, Here's an energy level diagram that basically shows sort of what happens. Uh, the atoms are created in an optical dipole trap in the lower F equals 1 level. Once they're accumulated and thermalized in that level, they're optically pumped uh, on the repumper transition until they're all brought up to the uh, uh, higher energy, uh, hyperfine component of the ground state. And uh, if you look at the signal from that, that's this signal. So this is the repumper signal pumping atoms up from F equals 1 to F prime equals 2, uh, and uh, then it decays away as you optically pump all the atoms to the upper hyperfine level, and then you turn that signal off, you turn off everything, and turn on a probe, and this is a probe signal. So it's not a complicated protocol. You make atoms in a MOT, you load them into a dipole trap, uh, you uh, turn off the dipole trap and optically pump the atoms to the upper hyperfine component, and then you probe them. Okay, these, uh, these optical dipole traps, you can get pretty high density. These experiments I'm going to show you here were taken in a CO2 laser-based dipole trap at about 30 watts, and we were able to get very large transfer efficiencies, 10 to 15 percent transfer efficiency into the dipole trap, and density is close to 10 to the 14th, uh, but not quantum degenerate, too hot to be quantum degenerate. Okay, so basically it's this piece of the signal that I'm interested in talking about here. Okay, so the first thing is in that signal, you can look at that signal as you tune the probe, frequ the frequency with which you probe the sample. And then you can integrate that block. And if you do that, you get a total scattered light intensity in some direction, some total in some direction that is not time dependent as a function of frequency. And if you plot that, uh, or if you take measurements of that as a function of the atomic uh, density, uh, then you find uh, the following result. At the highest optical depth, and this is an optical depth in the short direction of the dipole trap of 165, uh, so that's a little big, uh, but you see that the scattering amount of light, that's total amount of scattered light is down here. And as you let the cloud expand, spatially expand, it becomes larger and becomes more dilute at the same time. And as it does, the amount of light that's scattered from the sample goes up. Okay, like this, until you reach the optically more or less thin. This is an optical depth of five down here at the shortest. So, and so you can see a substantial, uh, if you go in from left to right, you can see a substantial decrease in the amount of light that's scattered as a function of, as a function of uh, time, if you like, as a function of expansion time for the sample. And there's two prevailing explanations for this, and one that seems to be pretty good 
to me is that uh, the amount of light that's scattered, the, the sample is optically deep almost no matter how big you let it get because it starts as such an op. So it absorbs nearly all the light that's incident on it. And so under those circumstances, the amount of light that's scattered should be proportional to the area, the sort of average area of the expanded cloud. And so you can scale that area as, it, so it turns out it scales as approximately one over the optical depth. And so if you plot the scattered light intensity versus one over the optical depth, you find that you get a straight line behavior, except for at the very lowest densities. And at the very lowest densities, there's some deep penetration into the cloud, and so the scattering is not just proportional to the area, but is approaching the, the scattering of the sum of the individual atoms, the sum of, scattering off the sum of individual atoms. The, uh, there's a second set of dots here that you can't see very much, just these dark red ones, but these are theoretical calculations, uh, and they agree pretty well with this. So the second argument, so anyway, I, th I think an aerial sort of geometrical argument works pretty well to describe this data, but, uh, uh, but another argument that just came out in a paper on the archive uh, argues that this decrease is in fact due to something else. It's due to the increase in the dipole-dipole interaction and the broadening of the lines as the density increases. It may be so. Uh, it's hard to say. I just say we, we have a pretty good model that explains the data pretty well, and so I think it's incumbent on other groups to prove that their explanation works just as well. So, so I'm not going to worry about that. Oh, there's these uh, these experiments are on resin. This one, I'm still on the same. Yeah, these ones, these are on resonance. So, so you look at the spectrum, of the spectrum of the emitted light is really hard because the spectral distribution of the light is only a couple of gigahertz. Uh, we have looked at uh, the spectrum of the, excita the excitation spectrum, which I'm going to show you now. And well, let me tell you that each one of these points uh, takes six to eight hours to take because the duty cycle for these experiments suck because you have to load a dipole trap. You do one realization in a photon counting mode and in time resolve mode, and then you have to rebuild the entire thing. So you make a new MOT, you load the dipole trap, you wait for it to thermalize, then you let it expand. Anyway, so it's, it's like a 10, 8 to 10 second duty cycle for a single measurement. And more clever people have ways of loading these faster, more clever ways than we have, and they also have more money, so it has something to do with it. Okay, so... Uh, in, any, in any case, uh, there's a nice picture where I don't have any idea what kind of molecule this is. Uh, but an alternative uh, way of thinking about these atomic clouds, and I'll explore this a little bit in the next, is, is to think of them, uh, next slides, is to think of them as a giant sort of molecule, like a million atom molecule that's weakly coupled in the sense that the atoms are, you don't have to be bound to be a molecule as long as you have some proximity. And so you can think of this thing as a, as a sample, as a molecule, as a whole that has excitation modes associated with it. And you could have me scattering off the object as a single unit, for instance. And there's some, that's a fairly compact way of explaining some of the other data that we see. So let's move on. Okay, so... Uh, this is one of the time-dependent curves that I showed you earlier, and this is when it's broken down into individual data points. So this data, this particular data is binned into 50 and 100 nanosecond bins. Uh, maybe these are 100 nanosecond bins, these particular ones. So this is the excitation of a probe, and this is the decay of the, decay of the, uh, or the afterglow after the probe is shut off. Uh, and so we make measurements of curves like this as as a function of the frequency of the probe laser. And so uh, if you look at, want to look at a characteristic one of these curves, that you look at this top one, you can see that it's approximately 60 megahertz across. There's a lot of broadening. Um, it's absorption broadening because the sample is so optically deep. And so this is what one of those curves looks like. Uh, and you can see that the shape of those curves depends on time. So for instance, if we measure the response at 100 nanoseconds, right here is one point, as a function of frequency, that would be in and out of the board and the other frequency, you get an action spectrum or an excitation spectrum. And these are fairly common in chemistry and chemical dynamics where you, you have a broad spectral response and you don't know what's happening or multitudes of things are happening. And so you, 
uh, you measure the spectral response as, as a function of time and as a function of frequency. And that's what this, that's what this graph represents as part of that data. Uh, these are, this is the full width at half maximum of each of these curves as a function of time when you take the data. Okay, so this is the shortest times at 2,000 nanoseconds is when the probe is shut off and what follows is the afterglow. Okay, or the glow of the sample after the excitation is turned off. Okay, so what we see first of all is that for very short times, uh, the bandwidth of this excitation, or the range over which you, you get significant excitation is very wide. It's 80 megahertz is the full width at half maximum. Okay, and one way to understand this is that uh, when you first expose the sample, you get scattering mainly from the surface from the atoms at the surface, and there isn't any, subs you don't have time for subsequent scattering deep into the sample. Uh, the scattering time for these processes, the Vigna scattering time is twice the lifetime, it's about 50 nanoseconds. So if you bin this at 50 nanosecond intervals, you're in pretty good shape for understanding what goes on, and you're still not smoothing too much. So if for very short times, the sample is exposed to this light, and it mainly scatters off the surface, and so if you estimate what the spectral width should be for scattering off the surface, defining the surface as an optical depth change of one, e to the minus one going inside, and predict the width of that spectrum, you get about 80 megahertz. That's this full width at half maximum is gamma scales as gamma times the square root of the optical depth. So that's pretty neat. And then you reach steady state. That's what all these data show. Uh, and then once you shut off the probe, the line width starts to narrow. And I'll show you that on the next slide. The spectral response of these things starts to narrow, and it gets down, in our case, to on the order of a few megahertz. Uh, this decrease in size corresponds to not necessarily the line width of the individual atomic excitation, uh, but instead to the lifetime of the longest lived mode that can exist in this collective sample. And so if you, if you excite this sample, you excite all sorts of modes They could be characterized as superradiant super radiant and subradiant modes, and the subradiant modes live a long time, and when you excite with a laser, you excite all sorts of modes, fast-lived ones, slower-lived ones, and longest-lived modes. The longest-lived mode in radiation trapping language would be called the Holstein mode, but it's the longest-lived diffusive mode if you thought of this thing as an entity as a whole. Okay, and so that longest-lived diffusive mode can be much longer than the lifetime of an individual atomic state. Okay, that's the key point. Uh, well, each, it depends on what basis you want to expand them into, but if you, uh, they're leaky modes, because we, it, but if you took a sphere, for instance, you could ex solve the diffusion equation inside a sphere subject to some leaky boundary conditions, and you could expand the solution in terms of spherical harmonics if you wanted to, for instance, and radial functions. And then the longest lived one of those modes, which you could calculate from the mode spectrum, uh, would correspond to something like the longest lived mode for this system. Okay. Okay, so when we measure the, the long time decay of this system, we see this decay like this. And this is sort of the longest lived mode, uh, which corresponds to this exponential decay out at three and a half microseconds. Uh, yeah, three and a half microseconds. You've got to remember the lasers were turned off at two microseconds, so this longest lived mode is, you know, more than a microsecond long, about a microsecond long. Actually, a little less. I lied. So uh, this is the, uh, if you make curves like this at different detunings, you can extract the longest lived mode as a function of excitation frequency. And you know what? It shouldn't matter at all. The longest lived mode is a property of the system by itself, and you can excite it with more or less efficiency by detuning, but you still excite the longest lived mode. And so the lifetime of the longest lived mode should be independent of detuning. Uh, this is the widest range we're able to go and get significant data. And there's a little tilt, you know, there's a little tilt, but within the, within the uncertainty of the measurements, there's not really a tilt. So, Okay, so for this particular kind of geometry, the question again, does coherence matter? For this kind of fluorescence geometry, you can understand a lot of this in terms of the language of modes and radiation trapping and collective excitations, and you don't really need to talk about interferences to explain most of the experimental data that we have for sideways scattering. For random lasing in three dimensions, 
yes and no. It depends on the type of random lasing. Uh, for super and subradiance, if you could see super and subradiant excitations, then yes, for sure. Anderson localization in three dimensions, uh, probably it's not possible in three dimensions, but one paper has recently shown that it's not possible for light scattering in three dimensions. That remains to be seen. But. Okay, so now I would like to stop with the, other than the amusement slide at the end, to, start to shift to our new results. And this is forward scattered light. Uh, that is measurements of the coherent forward scattered light as a function of spectral response and density and things like this. And these are our newest results. They're a couple of months old. Uh, this is an image of our atomic sample. And uh, it's a dipole trap sample. And the probe, this, this little blue hole that you see, represents the focusing of a probe beam through the center of this sample. Five minutes, including questions? Oh, no. Uh, and then ten minutes of questions. Okay. Okay, so this hole, this hole is a blow-away hole for those people in cold atom physics. We basically, we take the sample and we focus a resonant laser beam tightly in and we push the atoms out through the hole. And then we flash the MOT lasers on it and it makes the whole sample glow. And there's a place where there aren't any atoms and that's where there aren't any atoms. So this, this helps us sort of line up the probe to make sure that we're bisecting the sample pretty well. And so I think we do a pretty good job here. Okay, so near forward scattering of light in dense and cold atomic rubidium-87. What we're trying to do is to get a handle on the physics of the spectral response of the system. And the old-fashioned way to do that is to, the simplest old-fashioned way to do that is simply to measure the forward scattered, the amount of light that's forward scattered as a function of frequency and, other, and density. Okay, and from that you can, ex you can extract, for instance, the real and imaginary part of the index of refraction. So it's not a complicated kind of way to think about it, okay? And it's, it's correct. Uh, and some of you might say, well, it sounds boring, too. Well, we'll see. Maybe it is, but we'll see. In any, <laughs> in any case, the key experiments that have been done using this kind of experiment and, and similar configurations in warm vapors uh, were measurements of the Lorentz-Lorentz shift out of Bob Boyd's group in 1991, and later, uh, experiments by Van Kampen and others on the excitation fractional dependence of the Lorentz-Lorentz shift. The Lorentz-Lorentz shift, let me remind you, is the local field shift, of, uh, is the shift of a resonance due to a local field inside the medium. And it's about a 130-year-old kind of idea that most people think is pretty much right. Uh, and all the warm vapor experiments that have been done, these and a number of others, have shown that, in fact, that shift really does occur. It's correct, okay? Uh, but these, these experiments are all characterized by a common feature, and that is that they're all done in warm vapors, okay, where the atoms are racing around. There's a lot of self-averaging going on, okay? And there's some connected theoretical work. If you're going to read one paper here to learn the subject, this would be the one. And if you want to get an idea of some of the controversy that's going on in this field, then this paper, which I think is still on the archive, I don't know if it's been published yet, by uh, Yuda Yuha Jamanainen. And uh, it's a very interesting result. And then there's some other theoretical work that we've done, and there's even other. But the key point here is that in warm vapors, the 130-year-old result on Lorentz-Lorentz shift and on an equivalent expression for the, for the self-broadening work pretty well. Okay, they, in fact, they work very well. Okay, so let me give you an idea of the scale. The Lorentz-Lorentz shift in that traditional derivation, which is sketched here, shows that the frequency shift in per second units, not in angular units, is to the red by 3.5 F, where F is the oscillator strength, times 10 to the minus 11 kilohertz per cubic centimeter of density. Okay, so this corresponds to at, at a few times, at 10 to the 14th, it corresponds to about 3.5 megahertz, 10 to the 14th atoms per cc. So it's a measurable kind of quantity. Okay, there are key experiments in coal gases, not very many. Uh, one that we're doing, one, uh, this is an older paper uh, from uh, Juni's group in 2005. I'm sure there must be other results on this now that I hope to learn about. Uh, and there's the recent paper that just showed up on the ar archive uh, out of Anton Brauwe's group in Paris, uh, where they have, a, they have a microscopic trap of a few hundred atoms uh, at very high density. Okay, and our motivating questions are these. So let me shift. <clears throat> 
Okay, so I'm going to go quickly over this, but in the experiment, uh, we basically uh, have a dipole trap here and we bisect it with a probe beam and we collect the light either with a camera or with a fast timing system to measure time, time resolved measurements. I'm going to focus here on the camera measurements, which is the uh, measurement of the total transmitted intensity. Okay, so again, this is the way the system is done. We focus a probe laser, never mind light shift, we focus a probe laser through the center and detect the light that comes out. This is a repeat. And these are the results that we see. Okay, at low density, uh, uh, we, don't have a super, we don't have a super resolution laser. It's maybe a few hundred kilohertz line width. And so at low density of the dipole trap, we measure the atomic response as a function of frequency. And we want to make sure in this particular data that we're spot on to the atomic resonance. So that there, it's easy to lock your laser to uh, a few megahertz left or right if you're not careful, <coughs> with, particularly if you're just using saturated absorption. Uh, it's uh, sometimes difficult. And so we wanted to make sure that we were spot on, and we were. And so then we measure, uh, these are the densities. This is almost 10 to the 14th atoms. This is 7 times 10 to the 13th, 3 times 10 to the 13th. And this is the negative log of the transmission, which is basically the response function. That once you, So you're basically taking out the exponential part of the decay and looking at what's left over in the exponent, or this is the optical depth. And you can see that this line is fat, this line is less fat, and this line is less fat. And there also is a shift of this resonance. The shift of this resonance is to the high frequency side of resonance, is to the blue side of resonance, not the red side of resonance. Okay, so this certainly isn't the traditional Lorentz-Lorentz shift, and it must have some other kind of physical origin. Okay, and this is what this data look like, looks like if you plot it out. Uh, we only have four points at this time, but this is the density dependence to the shift. And this is the density dependence to the width. It's actually easier to get the width than it is to get the shift. And so that's why the data looks better for the width than it does for the shift. Uh, but uh, we've done a, a number of other experiments since this time, and every measurement we make shows that this resonance is to the blue. And so, yes? Uh, you've got to remember that this is the, this is, if you take this data, then you're measuring an, a transmission that goes down like this and comes up like this. So this corresponds to the least amount of light getting through the sample, so that's why it's got scatter. And uh, the, fact, the reason that there's more points on the left than on the right is because this result was unanticipated. Okay, and so we took data assuming that it was going to be about the middle, so we screwed up, right? But we won't screw up the next time. Okay, so anyway, there's a, there's, a real, there's a real question here, okay? Where is the Lorentz-Lorentz shift? What is the relationship between the shift we see in the dipole-dipole interaction? And by dipole-dipole interaction, I mean I'm speaking more broadly here about a dipole-dipole interaction that includes the Coulomb part, the longitudinal part, but also the radiative parts, okay, which are very important for these experiments. The radiative part gives rise to the collective lamp shift, for instance, which is sample shape dependent, among other things. And so this data was taken under conditions of constant sample shape, for instance, just in case we need to put, it doesn't, may not look like it, but the sample shape was the same. Okay, so uh, we're in the process right now of taking a, a more meticulous set of data over a wider density range. Uh, and with a little better control of our laser locks and our laser bandwidth to get better, better data on these shifts, and then we'll see what transpires. So I have 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Oh. Well, let's thank the yeah, well, I'm, I'm almost done, but I just wanted to know, okay, I've got either time for questions or time to show you a little bit of... Can you please show us the demonstration of the Anderson? I can. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is a... Experiment for undergraduates. Okay? But it's as, as a lot of things, it's a simple experiment or a simple question with not necessarily simple physics as an answer. And that's what's so cool about it. Okay, so this is the simple experiment. Okay, buy a non polarizing mean splitter cube from Thor Labs. Okay, go down to the undergraduate lab and borrow a helium neon laser. Broadband, multimode, helium, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Okay? Uh, stack up some glass slides. 
and measure the transmitted image of the light in the forward direction. And because we don't have two CCD cameras, we measure the backscattered light scattered off this slide with a power meter. Okay, that's it. That's the experiment. Okay, so when you do that experiment, you start stacking. So we bought some, we bought some cover slips, a whole bunch of cover slips, so we could make a whole bunch of different ensembles. Uh, we have enough to last 20 years. Uh, anyway, if you measure the transmission of the total intensity transmitted as a function of frequency, uh, as, a, as a function of the number of slides that you stack up, you get this green curve. If you measure the amount of light that's scattered in the backwards direction, oh, oh, I'm sorry. If you measure the amount of light that's scattered in the forward direction, you get the red curve, of course. It decreases. The backscattered light is the green curve. And normalized to their respective intensities, uh, you have a uh, reflection and a transmission coefficient, and the sum of those two is given by these, green, these blue dots. Okay, there's a little bit of drop-off there. So what we did is when we got to this range, we took, our power, took a power meter and put it on the sides and measured the amount of light that would just happen to come up. You can see it. If you look in the side, you can see a little bit of light coming out. So we measured it. So this loss of intensity is not due to absorption and dissipation of light into heat, but in fact is due to that little bit of light that leaks out the sides uh, because there's little bits of dust and stuff on these optics. You can't help it. Okay, so uh, that's one of the two main results. Okay, and now let me show you a movie. If I can find my, yeah, okay, so I'm going to show you a movie. This is the forward scattered images as a function of the number of slides. And you can just count them. Okay, and it's going to get ugly. But maybe not as ugly as you expect it will get. Okay, that looks like a monster. Okay, that's it. That's 20 slides. So what's happening? Okay, I'm going to start the, slide, start the thing again. And you'll notice that for the first few slides, nothing happens. The intensity changes, but the shape of the, of the dot in the middle stays about the same. And then it starts to distort a little bit. But it never completely distorts. I mean, the light doesn't start to fill the CCD camera. It stays in a narrow cone. And that's why the system is called a quasi-one-dimensional system. The spots that you're seeing are individual speckle spots. And the only way you can develop speckle is if you go outside a strictly one-dimensional system and go into quasi-one-dimensional, because you have to have a little bit of transverse K vector to get it. Okay, so this kind of exponential decay and uh, cons conservation of the total flux is a hallmark of Anderson localization. Okay, Anderson localization is interferometric suppression of transmitted quantity. Could be electrons, could be any wave structure in the forward direction. Uh, the way that it works in this particular case is that I'd like to draw your attention to this little picture which I lifted out of a paper by Barry. Uh, so imagine these are slabs of glass, just glass slides. Okay, and so there's, there's a lot of possible multiple scattering paths, but one of them comes in, scatters off the last slide, scatters off the first slide, and then goes out. The second, a second way is you scatter off the intermediate plane, then off the first slide, then off the last slide, then off the intermediate plane again, and then out. Okay? So because both of these have in common a reflection off the, first, off the last plane and the first plane, we could ignore the phase shift for those. So the only phase shift that you get is from this intermediate plane. Okay, N1 is the index of refraction, and it's either bigger or smaller than N2. One's bigger, one's smaller. Okay, and so that means that one of these reflections, these internal reflections, is, an, is what you'd call an internal reflection, and the other is an external reflection. That is, one has a phase shift of pi, and one has a phase shift of zero. Okay, so this configuration of double scattering, which is the lead leading order of scattering with this number of slides, means that it's mandatory to have destructive interference in this scattering. There's a phase shift of pi. And it doesn't matter how far apart these things are. The path difference is, is common for all of them. And so this basically shows that you must include interference in this treatment and that that interference is necessarily destructive interference for forward scattered light. Okay, go ahead and play the game of adding other ones and adding them all up, and you find that the net result, uh, they converge pretty quickly, is destructive interference. Mark, are your slides equal thickness and equal space? They all look equally spaced in your... They're not equally spaced. Okay. We just, 
Yeah, we just stack them in. We just stack them up. We don't care. We don't care. No, and then we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again. And uh, so we don't care. We just, we just want to make sure that once we, once we stack them and we wait the five seconds for an individual microscope slip to squeeze the air out from the next one, it takes about five seconds to do it until it's stable, and then we do it again. Okay, so then I got one more slide to show you, and that's this slide on the right. This is a very important slide. Okay, this shows the variance in the transmitted intensity normalized to the squared average intensity. Okay, now the reason this is very important is because Anderson localization is characterized by the particular quality of, of noise distribution in the forward, of this forward scattering, scattered intensity as a function of length. Okay, and so our experimental data are these red dots. The typical means it's just the first ones I fetched. I mean, we're not finessing anything here. Okay, the, do the dotted curve is a curve that was written, that was derived by Abrikosov when he was in Landau's group. And this is the same Abrikosov as Abrikosov lattice and all these kinds of things. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an analytical formula for the noise that is not good for one or two slides, but is good for the rest. And you can see that it's a very good characterization of the noise. Roughly speaking, the noise for this system should be shot noise for small amounts of scattering and evolve towards speckle type noise. There's huge fluctuations proportional to the, number, to the amount of intensity for long noise. So this is a one-dimensional demonstration of Anderson localization uh, with classical scatterers. Okay, classical scatterers, not quantum scatterers. And so what we would like to do is to try to, to do this kind of experiment where we have atoms as atomic scat as, as scatterers, they're quantum scatterers with quantum light. Okay, so it's profoundly different because the atoms can be, the atom properties themselves can be uh, modified by the presence of the light. Okay, so that's different than what we have here, but this is classical Anderson localization. Okay. Well, let's thank Mark again. Okay.